Good. Perfect. Well, I would love to, if you don't mind, to tell a little bit of the story of how you became custodian uh, in Mallorca and, and maybe just a, just a brief intro to that, because that just sounds such a, um, like a major step in your pathway and well, this re-inhabitation. Well, just grounding, like basically, it, it's a story of a story of privilege, as um, custodianship normally is. Um, like it's partially because my father passed away, and, and for the first time in my life, I, I was able to acquire a piece of land. But mm. I find it really impossible to name it as our or my piece of land because yeah, it right. simply does not make sense. Mm -hmm. it, it's such a preposterous yeah. notion to say, like to stand on a piece of earth, being a biological being with a lifespan of somewhere between 75 and 100 years, surrounded by, by trees. I've, I planted 100 oaks since we got here. Mm -hmm. They will be around in 500 years. Really, they, they, they would laugh. <laughs> Yes, they this would. is my land. Yeah? Mm. Um, it's more their land than my land already. Mm -hmm. um, and and so anyway, but but the very process of doing what I've dreamt of for 25 years, mm. um, which is growing roots in a place over the long term while living the questions, like trying to be a good custodian, yeah. learning how to live lightly on the earth. Um, but in a way that is also transferable to neighbors and, and mm. trying to be the, the yogurt culture and the milk to transform mm -hmm. beyond mm. that place. And it, I've always had, had that dream. And the first time I tried to do that was in the Alpujara in, in 1999, 2000. And, and I just ran against the wall for a number of reasons, um, mainly my own ignorance as well at the time. And it, it in, and failing or, or not failing, but not manifesting that then is actually what took me to Schumacher College and mm. put me on my journey. Um, so it's, it's been a 25 year journey that I feel like to some extent I'm coming back mm. to this more practical permaculture, soil regeneration, planting a food forest, wiring up solar panels, dealing with water catchment systems, both from, mm. from the, infrastructure but also in in the soil and in the land landscape yeah, yeah, yeah. and all that work is is something that when when you actually engage it in it with a piece of land there's an opportunity to have a embodied experience of relationship with more than human nature um, yeah. and, and it's I, I love zooming out and I've talked to many gardeners and many agri agriculturalists and forest gardeners and subtropic farmers that that kind of zone you get into when you've been in the garden for mm. half an hour to an hour and you you lost kind of track of time yeah and and how often one goes from A to B and ends up at C because you've been called and mm. you, you end up doing a job and then you kind of go I was on my way Oh, oh, yeah, and, and, yeah. Ah, and it's yes. a very common experience for gardeners. That, that, and and, and you, you can't really, once you have that relationship, you can't, like a friend of mine who has been very instrumental in promoting the, um, the network of regenerative agriculture mm. in the Iberian Peninsula. She, mm. she used to live here on Mallorca and now lives in the Basque Country. And um, I recently watched a video of hers where she says, but the most important thing for a farm is not how we fertilize it or what techniques we use. It's the paseito of the farmer. It's the little walk mm. of the farmer. And, and it, it's true because that's where the love flows. That's where the communication happens. That's where you see that plant needs help. They're doing well. Um, like where, where we become nurturers again and and cus true custodianship and, and, and yeah anyway I'm, I'm babbling but but that's no it's that's not a babble exciting. this is relevant yeah. it's relevant to everything because it's that little walk that we need to reinstate so much of my early days um 
was in the this concept of ecological restoration. And for years, we did a lot with, um, with uh, this was in the Chesapeake Bay, and there was mm -hmm. a lot of dredging uh, to maintain the depth for shipping. And the, the Chesapeake is a very long, very shallow um, estuary that required constant maintenance dredging just to allow for these Panamax type ships to come in. Just he hearing you say, say that makes me rem remember one of my favorite, like, you know how sometimes you get a piece of information, you kind of go, oh God, that's another nightmare to, to deal with. <laughs> yes. And you sort of put it on the back burner. I saw, I, read, I don't know if it was a documentary or, uh, or I read an article, but it was about the ammunition dumps that happened yeah. after each major war yep. and how basically the shells that used to have mustard gas in the First yep. World War in them have about a hundred year corrosion time and were dumped yep. about a hundred years ago in places like the Chesapeake Bay, the exactly. Irish Sea, the North Sea. And, and so when I heard you dredging um, depth of channel, I thought, maybe not a good idea. Hope they Oh my gosh, totally. There's In fact, there's islands that we were, were so part of what we were doing is, is these were considered spoils. They were considered waste. A lot of them had um, um, all sorts of chemical contaminants. And so it was all considered this massive get rid of it. And we're like, well, wait a second. How do we reuse it? How do we actually think about what's going on here? And the the water withdrawal from the Delmarva Peninsula yeah. was um, being drawn at such a rate for agricultural purposes that the land was actually slumping. Uh, it's a coastal plain. And so because of that, the sea level rise was like three times the, the global rate. So the islands were just dissolving. And the, the dissolving of these islands, some of which were used as bombing targets. Mm -hmm. And so those what's called UXO, unexploded ordnance, was, was just riddled through some of these islands. Um, and others were just disappearing. And these were absolutely central to uh, waterfowl habitat, and all sorts of um, cultural dimensions. But we did this massive process of integrating with the Corps of Engineers, the Army of all things, the Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, the Port of Baltimore, and even some um, of the big shipping carriers, and a whole lot of NGOs um, and other philanthropy, and did massive large-scale restoration of the tidal wetlands and built up these islands to contain um, sort of half forest and half tidal marsh. But a key thing for that, two things, the little walk of the farmer is so important on these sites that you're constantly seeing and making adjustments and what do we need to do? Um, and the thing that I didn't recognize, even though I was bringing thousands of people into the process, it was only until I started asking the question, why are you keep coming back? Because I would see the same faces over and over again. And then you'd get into the depth of the conversation and you'd hear, it wouldn't, it wouldn't surface immediately, but you'd hear over time, I'm a recovering addict or alcoholic. I'm, a, I'm, I'm coming back from war. I've been dealing with this level of trauma my whole life. So this issue of trauma to heal thyself is to heal thy earth and to heal thy earth is to heal thyself and I, it's but just what you what, what you mentioned I, yesterday i was thinking about this and because we moved so many times as i mentioned earlier i am um, and we just recently moved well recently a year ago i still have a lot of stuff in boxes that i but somewhere i have a t-shirt which is the t-shirt of a conference um that was held at Findhorn while I was at Schumacher College doing my master's and it was called Restore the Earth Conference. Mm. And, it, and it was under the auspices of the United Nations. It was John Manucheri who was working for UNIV mm. at the time, who was at the conference and doing the UN spiel of giving the official kind of support to this, declaring the 21st century, the, the century for earth restoration. Mm. And, and the, the Findhorn kind of designed t-shirt for the event mm. was a beautiful celtic symbol and it had nature healing humanity humanity healing nature oh, healing humanity, humanity healing nature in a circle around it and 
And it's just so like the, the whole concept of care farming, we have reams of research yeah. that shows that this is true, that post-traumatic stress, that even, even neurological differences being on the spectrum can get balanced and, 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 and more harmonized by deep work with nature. And, and we know that it improves our um, physical well-being, mm-hmm. the quality of food we eat, like the research that's now coming out is that the quality of food we eat seriously matters. Somebody told me yesterday, I haven't followed up the research yet, but that a, an orange in the 1950s had more vitamin C and minerals than now eight oranges have, if you buy them. Oh, interesting. Wow. And, and this kind of research is happening on all scales, yeah. but the micro salts, the micronutrients, everything yep. that, that healthy food coming from a healthy ecosystem actually contains yep. is lacking in us and is the real reason for pandemics of all sorts and yep. endemics of all sorts. Not And, and we cannot, and, and with the Planetary Health Alliance, naming this from a health policy perspective saying we will not be able to stomach the health bills as any kind of nation yeah never mind the nations that don't even have proper health systems yet if we don't find the link between ecosystems health and human population health and to heal the planet it, I mean, it, it, we, we have the wind in our sails if we make that link. The whole regeneration movement is ultimately the way to do what these policymakers of 230 universities are talking about. Because yeah. the, the fascinating thing is that they also agree with us, our analysis, on the level that the only scale at which you can meaningfully make interventions yeah. on planetary health is not oh, let's solve the global problem, climate change, by declaring war on climate change. No, it's by healing your ecosystems in your bioregions. It's at the yeah. bioregional scale. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, it's interesting, the, the new IPCC, the, the sixth um, edition, essentially, chapter seven focuses, and it's like 120 pages and 60 pages of citations. It's all about um, human health, and climate. Mm -hmm. Nowhere do they mention this. And yet it's a beautifully researched and the the Mm -hmm. authors are stunning, but nowhere do they mention to heal thy earth is to heal thyself. Nowhere do they talk about this. So there's this missing piece with this that that is, and and, um, and one of the things that we're doing a lot now, and, and I'm doing in other places, but really here, much the same way that you're growing roots. I too am growing roots here in, this is um, ancestral Wabanaki territory. This is the Gulf of Maine, and this is Portland, Maine. Um, and it's, um, we're doing bi- uh, learning journeys. And this learning journey concept is really all about the reimagining of oneself into one's bioregion, but doing it together. Can I, can I share something with you that you will love and, and maybe pencil it into your diary? Um, well, we still haven't fixed the dates yet, but it's probably the end of October last week or the first week of November. Ah. I, I, was, I was contacted by, well, actually, I went to this very interesting event in Delphi of all places in Greece. Mm. Um, which was called the Now Assembly, um, Nature of Wonder. And it was uh, amazing. Uh. I mean, it, like Bob Costanza was there and mm. uh, like very wide range of people, but it was run by two Russian people who run the Dolphin Embassy in the Canary Islands. Um, uh. w- worth looking up. Um, and anyway, at this event, I met... Professor Tobias Lute, a relatively young German who, like younger than me a little bit, um, Germ- German the, that lives in Zurich, but teaches mm. at a number of design schools and is a, is a very passionate mountain guide and mm. um, like also very active, like an extreme sports skier type. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but also like with his students researched the hemp industry, created a, um, a little spin-off company that makes the, the most advanced pure hemp um, natural resin skis on the market. Um, and wow. And he invited me 
to help him design a, a mass, massive open online course that is, is being announced, I think, next week um, on designing regenerative and resilient systems that ETH mm. Zurich is, is launching. And um, as part of that, we are doing a bioregional learning a regeneration lab Mallorca sub story. Mm. And um, one of the offers that the MOOC will give to a subset of the people that take the MOOC, because lots of people normally take these MOOCs, about 10,000 mm -hmm. people from all over the mm -hmm. world, mm -hmm. um, is to invite a, a group of design academics, supply chain academics, bioregional weavers, um, teachers, students, um, consultants in in sustainability regeneration all that it, it, people who think systemically about um, place-based change yeah and tobias has developed this absolutely together with a, another swiss friend of his who was a bike designer but also teaches at various design schools in switzerland they they came up with this amazing uh, i'm triggered by your learning journeys mm. um concept which they call systemic cycles Mm. And it's, it's a brilliant name, and you will immediately find out why. It's ba basically, in a nutshell, I describe what we're going to do in October. People arrive, they roughly about 15 to 20 people, three guides, Tobias, that other guy from Switzerland, Martin, and, and me as mm. the local anchor. Um, we cycle around Mallorca, and in, mm. six, in six days, we every day, every morning, we cycle to one place and we spend two and a half hours there. Then we cycle on to a lunch where the, the lunch is a story about quite kilometer zero local food. Um, and yep. um, yeah, then we cycle to another place in the afternoon. And then in the evening, we do a kind of designerly sketching, mapping over a glass of wine, really relaxed, but being very creative and creating output from the questions we asked during the day. Yep. And, and we do that every day for six days. Um, mm. And one of the gifts back to each place visitors is not just a small, like here, 150 euros, thank you very much for spe spending two and a half hours. Yep, with yep. But it's a humble, not a kind of um, California style, we're getting the world experts together, they come and they hothouse and yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. hack yeah. the hell out of your place and, and tell you what to do. No, yep. much more humble than that. Like we, we come in and say, you know your place, you know your people, you know your business. Mm -hmm. yep. We're just coming to learn. But we're in this field of systemic transformation. So yep. we'll, we'll think about it and we'll ask some questions. And most likely it's not the questions, but it's what you think triggered yes. by the questions. Yes. It will possibly just give you a wonderful idea. So it, it won't be our idea, it will be yours, but we might trigger it after we've been to see you. And that, that's that's what we, and then mm. at the end of those six days, there's another added, and this is what, what we added since, like the, the first two pilots have already been run of this. And I, I can ah. send you a link of- I would love to see that. In, in, I think he did one in, in, the, in the Turin region in Italy and another one in Norway somewhere. Um, and um, yeah, the, what we're adding on in Mallorca is that at the very end, we do another half day, like on, on, the, on the seventh day, so to speak, where we invite everybody who's been visited to, an, to a kind of more yeah. celebratory style local food event. Yeah, where Beautiful. We, we might even get local government and, and, and some people to, to co-sponsor it. Um, so get, get some local stakeholders also to the event. And then all the... The participants of the course basically do a very quick one minute, two minute on each of the 18 places visited mm. and, and just ask the people who, who have shown up to this on stage and get a little applause. And, but the, the point being, of course, is that you're weaving systemic cycles, not just between professionals who will form bonds because they're not just doing a course together, they're cycling a few hundred kilometers across Mallorca together and actually putting a journey onto a landscape. Like there's a physical movement embodied through place. And, yeah. and then they, everywhere they meet the people, they disarm them because they come as sweaty cyclists. They don't come <laughs> as, right. as, as kind yes. of clipboard 
academics yes. or, or right. consultants with with yeah with, with the Patagonia jacket. <laughs> then, oh my gosh, I love it. Well, count it's me in. It? I mean, it's not my. The, the, just to be clear, this is Tobias and Martin's design. Yeah. it's just brilliant. Brilliant. So I'm, I'm going to play with it with with them here. Uh, so it is just so lovely because so many of those elements are woven into some of our thinking here. But boy, the exchange could go so much further. Um, so we have actually both biking aspects and sea kayaking because a key aspect of this is we want to actually try to transport everyone to see through the eyes of the seagrass beds. So to really transport the seeing um, as well as the indigenous peoples. And we'll, we'll have, we'll have basically um, the chief of the local tribal community who I've been doing a lot of work with is loves the idea of the partnering and well the native content throughout the, this aspect but it's this deep listening as you described and this deep sensing of the people of the place and food is woven into it and in fact the very first um part of this is going to be um it's all about local bioregionalism and food systems and its relationship if you're in the seagrass beds what does that mean and of course, there is food that comes from the meadows themselves, but it's the relationship of the food and the watershed and, of course, wastewater treatment, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. and its connection with the eelgrass meadows. So we'll have a lot of sea kayaking as well. So the systemic cycles will be systemic kayaking nice. as well, or systemic nice. paddling. And well, um, if I'm a paddleboarder, like I could immediately spin Oh, that my gosh. On, on and my we're using... Uh, we're using the um, indigenous image of the uh, magic canoe. Mm -hmm. And this comes from a Pacific Northwest, the bioregioning work there from the um, killer whale clan. But it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a good idea. You know, we're coming together and we need to learn how to actually be in a same vessel as we navigate the, the torrents. But it's not as if we know the answers. We don't. We just can get so much better at asking the questions and thinking about what it means to actually navigate and paddle together with the views of nature, with the rights of nature. You know, I, I must, like, if you haven't seen it, really treat yourself to this conversation. And um, one of the people I met, were, were you at the Commonwealth event in October um, 2019? No, no, no. I think no, uh, um, Christopher Cohen was, and like lots yeah. of our shared friends were. Yes, uh, that's exactly. Why, that's Stuart why I was Cowan. suddenly thinking, am I telling something he, yeah. he you know, <laughs> because he was there? But um, no, I, I met a wonderful man called Johnny Freeland um, mm. from, from New Zealand um, at this event. And he was part of the, the Maori delegation mm. of, of the regenerative work that, that has been going on down Incredible there. Incredible work. Where the oh. Genesis group people have met indigenous Maori knowledge and they've yep. sort of recognized that there was resonance. Uh, yeah. and, and, and there's this beautiful conversation with Johnny where he very often refers to, because I think that image of the canoe is, is a Polynesian mm -hmm. uh, image that, that has been all over the Pacific, not, not yep. just in, in, in the yep. Pacific Northwest. Truly, without and, a doubt. And the whole notion of being navigators, it, it just check out this conversation and watch out for the bit where he goes on about us being navigators and the role of navigators. Mm, and it's beautiful. It's, it's really a treat. Like, um, and I'm also very happy to put you in touch. I think you'd have an amazing conversation. I would love that. And I would love to welcome you if you um, can't make it, but maybe we connect you with Zoom so that your presence is felt at this learning journey. This will be in August. Um, we're also doing one, a similar one up at Tayside. Um, so, the, you know, the wider Dundee area. And this came out of some work that we've been doing with folks that they've now just launched, bioregioning Tayside. And so they'll be doing a learning journey there. Ooh. We have one in the West Fjords of Iceland that um, is actually perfectly linked to the, um, the West Fjords Way, which is a bike route, essentially. And it's sort of become all the rage for biking. And so we, we know that there has to be this weaving of cycling and bioregioning um, in the West Fjords, wow. um, similar to County Mayo, Ireland. We've got um, something similar going on there. Of course, um, with Isabel, we did a, um, we did a big, um, 
learning journey back in 2019 mm -hmm. um, that was um, the Devon that has led to South Devon's sort of thinking of the Devon Donut and all sorts mm -hmm. of applications. Um, so I just love the systemic cycling concept. So if there's any way to, to put me on that list, mm. I, well, I could really absolutely. think about going there. Um, I, I'm just amazed. Joining. Because, like, my, my kind of synergy um, radar is just, just sort of maxing out right now. Um, yeah. Like uh, you mentioning that you're also doing something in Tayside. Mm -hmm. Just last week, I started a process of, of sort of mutual exploration and coaching with, with a um, guy that runs a wonderful project in Fife. Oh, really? And is it um, John, um, Ennis, John Ennis? Ah. John, John Ennis um, is, is a, and he's also a really fascinating guy in the sense that of what we we're talking about earlier with regard to the link between human health and ecosystems health. Because yeah. He's, he's originally a trained doctor. Mm. And he, was, he worked in the NHS and then he basically um, decided that, that he wanted there was something else to do with his life that was beyond working for the NHS. And, and he set up, if you look at the, the website, it's called Journeys in Design. Oh, wow. And, and he is a, like, because you, you've had, had the, you know who Geddes is and all that. He's, oh, he's, yeah, a, yeah, yeah. he's completely inspired by Geddes. He's in a mm. gorgeous way reviving the, the Gedesian heritage in Scotland mm. through a number of materiality focused design journeys. And his, since he lives in Fife, he set up a flax festival and brought craftspeople together around the bioregion of Fife working on flax processing. And he's got a little project going where he gets people all over Scotland to grow one square meter of flax. Oh, oh that's brilliant. It's, it's all, it's so done with such exquisite design detail. Like he came and visited and he brought a tea towel made out of flax that uh, had the cut out pattern of a doll that was referring to the ladies who worked in the mills of Dundee in the uh, processing. And there was a classic doll that they made. And it was basically that tea towel enabled you with a cutout pattern to remake those ancient dolls. And then he made a little competition where people made the dolls up and set and colored them in. And, and he used that as an art exhibition as a curator. I mean, the guy is, is really oh my on. And you, you, next time gosh. you're in Tayside, you, you must connect. Like Okay, so <laughs> well, just Tayside alone, we've got so much to talk about. So do you know uh, Ninian Stewart? Um, who's the hereditary keeper of, of the Falkland yeah. Palace. Yeah, so he's been doing some really remarkable work and those two should connect mm -hmm. because what he's trying to do is, is stop the hereditary progenitor, you know, inheriting of the land and really giving back. And he's created all sorts of um, mini houses and and, um, and also just other, other um, bioregional framing in the wider Falklands. Um, so that's just one. And then also at the, um, the Dundee Botanical Gardens, this absolutely amazing guy who's the new head, he would love this. And he's, got a, he's working with a lot of students um, who are really pushing the bounds of bioregionalism. Um, you see, the thing is that, that there is an opportunity in Scotland. Um, yes. Because of the particular situation with Scottish nationhood, Yep. And, and totally the, the hundreds of years of distinct cultural heritage that has punched incredibly above its weight, bad metaphor, yeah. um, but but you know what I'm trying to say. Like, yep. Yep. Uh, basically for the achievement of four and a half million people in meaningfully influencing the cultural intellectual discourse and pathways of part of Western culture and beyond yeah. is, is pretty impressive in physics, in philosophy, in, yes. economics, in the good and in the bad. Huh? And yep. I mean, yep. Adam, Adam Smith, <laughs> yep. was, um, but also he, he would, he would probably roll over what we call the free yeah. market. <laughs> yes, totally. <laughs> like, totally. I'm, I'm, with, I'm with Kenny Osgill from the Bioneers on that. He, he used to say, when people say the free market, I always say, do you mean free as an imperative? I, I'm, I'm all with you. <laughs> Yes. Our, our market is anything but free. Yeah. 
<laughs> oh my gosh, I totally agree. And Nicola Sturgeon with her, um, one of the things that I've been so impressed is she's looked to the north and really has reimagining Scotland as a near Arctic community. And that opens up a whole new dialogue with Arctic communities and the reality of, you know, in terms of ground zero of the changing landscape. And, um, and we do a lot of work now. In fact, we've just opened, you'd love this, and we'd love to get you involved. There's a, within the U-Arctic, which is an, um, sort of a quasi-academic, um, and it's more pracademic, that came out of the, um, of the Arctic Council. So it engages with all the, the governance issues of across the Arctic countries and near Arctic countries. But there's a thing, um, they have these thematic networks and we've just launched a thematic network of bioregioning for resilient rural communities. Um, and so is to bring in the bioregioning, not bring in to, because <laughs> it's well imagined already. The Sami people have been bioregional yeah. pastoralists for thousands of years. Um, so, but it's it's something that that brings this idea into the the language of the U Arctic, and um, and well, boy, you, what kind of response? To, I'll put you in touch with Tobias Lute because part of Tobias' foot is in northern Norway, and he's done Bob sledging stuff. In oh, Norway fantastic! Has a, has a complete link into that world through. Where in Norway uh, is he? Uh, I, uh, I keep forgetting which university is. I, I know that he has some something to do, like he did something on the island of Bergen, but I mm. don't know through which university was it. I think they're based. Oh my gosh! Well, check this out. We've got this amazing young woman from Bergen who's now in Oslo, but she's working with us as a fellow, and she's doing all sorts of amazing work in um, data science, GIS, etc. But her passion is bioregioning. And so uh, from there, so we've got some good, good contacts. And of course, the, the deep um, connection with people like Karen O'Brien and others um, in Oslo. Um, so, oh my gosh. For me, this brings up, a, a, I wonder how you live that paradox, because I find mm. that I have a very deep issue around this, like even even to now, I, I do a lot of work here on Mallorca, but it's actually in between the holes of my yeah. normal life. It's not my main business at all. Like to the contrary, I have to protect my family and my mm. core capacity to generate income um, from my inner predisposition to only do work healing the piece of land I steward and only do work trying to weave bioregional collaboration and, and, and these kind of learning journeys. And, yeah. and what, what I've realized is that the, the path of alliance building of, don't you see there's a bigger picture, we all fit together and we can transform this mm -hmm. island and the great potential, which to some extent I can't let go of because mm -hmm. it, it's the old pattern of solutioneering a kind of, mm -hmm. you see it all fits together. I, I can yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. It makes sense. Like even within your paradigm, I can show you how it all fits like a puzzle and, and would create a more resilient, more healthier future for all. But um, that form of intervening, particularly in the culture that I'm in, is, is actually doomed to fail. Yes. Uh, you just create a cacophony of voices yeah. that actually don't see what you can see as a systemic integrator. Yeah. And, and you actually create the opposite. You create animosity because people go, mm -hmm. I can't get it. Yeah? And so this whole notion of Regenesis Group, and like yesterday, I just talked with, with, with the Reed again and, and Anna Pollock about regenerative tourism. And, and we came back to this, yeah, modal interventions and, and building a field and a much more subtle, much less solutioneering based yeah. um, approach. And in many ways, I'm beginning to realize it's the only way that I can keep my sanity in this. Mm -hmm. uh, because like, it's easy for me to weave a little bit through a specific event like systemic cycles or like bringing some people here to Mallorca and showing them certain aspects of it and then inviting local people to, to the conversation so there's a true exchange. Um, that also has a sort of subtle way of building field, but I can arrange that within the context that, that it also 
pays for my time and and um, doesn't interfere with the rest of um, mm-hmm. but, but uh, all of this relates to the thing that 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 I always feel why why I haven't engaged with you more because I know that you're building this global network of bioregional initiatives and I'm really tempted to kind of take a deep dive and learn about each one of them and be in the meetings and participate in a global learning community. And I've realized I simply at this phase of my life could not do that and still have the capacity to do anything on my land or locally, because if I do that in free time, that uses up my free time. If I also try to do global networking among bioregional initiatives, then that directly competes either with my family, my capacity to generate the income I need to generate, or um, projects I'm already doing that, that are really also significant. Yeah, well, beautifully said. And I have to say that my arc of global has actually, I'm actually on the, I've gone from peak global down on the other side mm-hmm. to actually to relocal. Um, and so really, rather than growing by regional um, initiatives around, what I like to do is help to germinate them and let them grow in their own way, but then, but then really learn how to best step away. And with that, I've made a decision, and this was my own um, reality, of really shifting towards a transition of going from a point where I literally don't hop on a plane mm-hmm. and, and, and commit to that. And that's probably about four or five years away Um, maybe a little longer, but then everything becomes here. And I'm completely fine with that. So my engagement with the tribal communities, the engagement with these learning journeys, the working of transboundary issues in the Gulf of Maine, the sandbox is right here. The bioregional sandbox is right here. And it's, it's so beautifully, the opportunity is so huge because number one, that border, like all borders, is such a force of disconnection. Mm -hmm. It is such a wedge between seeing and connecting and accelerating any sort of systemic change. So just thinking about and engaging with the Gulf of Maine is absolutely fine with me. And so that's where I'm I'm heading. So um, there's others that I I feel are doing um, good work with sort of global weaving and f- seeing themselves at that, mm-hmm. that's absolutely wonderful. So I, I see that, that, that a lot of the interest that I had, it, it's not waning, but my attention is waning. My yeah. attention is re- realigning and refocusing well, then, on the local. Then, then we're, like I, I still haven't found a way to resource my local work, but I'm beginning to find new pathways of inventing interventions that I can resource in order to do the local work, but but I, I I mean it's funny because I had a very strong no fly attitude after flying far too much in my life until about 1999, and then from about 2000 until 2006 I didn't mm. fly, mm. and and then I went back into it because I felt it was necessary. But but now having had this experience of just being on the island, I I actually really. Yeah, I, it's it's more what George Monbiot called love miles, like seeing my family and, yeah. and that, that, that I find harder to let go of. And sometimes it just doesn't fit to travel over land for ages to make it happen, particularly when you have like family, school holidays and all that to, to deal with. <laughs> like, yeah. With, with Alice's mother living in the Orkney Islands. But mm. I just wanted to go back to one thing. I mean, it's wonderful. I think we all need to somehow re in, like re-inhabit, like Gregory yeah. Snyder's wonderful poem, says, yes. or, or the word creation says. Um, but you mentioned Posidonia, and that made me click because there's a, or, or, or seagrass meadows you mentioned. Mm-hmm. I don't know what species you're talking about. Zostra mostly here, mm-hmm. uh, but it's rupia as well. Um, and there's a few others, but it's really Zostra is the main, is the dominant species here mm-hmm. um, in the Gulf of Maine. Because the other bit that made me 
sort of triggered me a little, like earlier when you mentioned that you have a background in the conservation industry, because mm -hmm. one thing that I'm faced with as a flashpoint of possible disagreement here at the moment mm -hmm. is that that I've been working with a wonderful guy who set up this foundation called Save the Med um, for a number of years now, sort of as a friend coaching him as he was was really doing all the amazing work that he's done. And he's now building an alliance of different cons conservation agencies around the sea, which we have a kind of glut of in, in the mm -hmm. Balearics, they yeah. have a lot. And they're not so many focused on land. And in order to yeah, actually do yeah. integrated ecosystems restoration, so I, I've, true. Been, I've been seeding with him this notion that really that the way to distinguish his organization and play a role and bring it all together yeah. is to, to have that conversation about how would we create landscape scale ecosystems restoration yeah. on land and link it in an island context in an archipelago where you have four islands that are basically models for four different sizes of bioregion. Mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. And you can be fractal around place where you can study each one of them as a bioregion and you can mm -hmm. st study the more, more composite bioregion of, of that fractal of the whole Balearics and the sea in it. That That's a sort of conceptual thing that, that Brad just picked up and ran with um, from and, and, and now it, it's really coming together. But the thing that we are facing is that both in his organization, like the, the amazing, really committed scientists, passionate scientists that he's hired, as well as the scientists and many of the other organizations have all gone through the same conventional training yeah. about yeah. conservation and preservation. Yeah. And that is a dogma, not science. It is a dogma, it, totally. It, it is ultimately pretending it's 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 all based on a false assumption which is the yep. false assumption is that there is a sort of data point at which the ecosystem was pristine and perfect <laughs> and and that you can somehow get back to that data point yes. if you just regulate the shit out of it yeah and, and no of course it never worked um but but even from a point that we have triggered runaway climate change um, and every single species on the planet is on the move um height distribution, temperature distributions regionally and altitudinally, they're all changing, which means the pollinator and pollinators yeah. the pollinated and the pollinators are um, moving apart. We, we will see collapses of whole populations simply because of that. And in the context of that, we're now worried about a little bit of healing an ecosystem by introducing species that fit that climate zone, yeah. but, but, but and might might be more adapted to climate change. Like we're, we're giving away the one thing that when we see humans as nature and as the anticipatory capability of nature yeah, and transformative resilience as the ecological social system that has that capacity because we are part of nature in bioregional custodianship, then by, by how, how do you work like to... to I couldn't model, agree how, more. How do you work with this this resistance towards, for example, here on Mallorca, yeah. bringing in um, Tom Gouraud, mm. who's done work on microcurrents into the sandy sea, seabed at a certain mm -hmm. depth. Mm -hmm. And then you plant Posidonia in, in between. Posidonia grows incredibly slowly. That's our mm. seabed here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The largest human being on the planet is the Posidonia meadow be between Formentera and Ibiza. Mm. It's, it, 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 it clones itself, so it's all one genome, and it's, it's massive, kilometers squared. And, and what, what John has realized is that while taking a piece and putting it somewhere else doesn't really add, because mm -hmm. you're damaging one and it take, grows so slowly in the other and the likelihood that it might not take is existent. Eh? But if the minute you put a microcurrent into the seabed, very small voltage, nothing invasive, just a, a small metal grid into the seabed that carries this, this current, then you can do it with renewable energy on the buoy. Mm. Um, eh? what, what happens metabolically is that all the kind of maintain energy levels, cellular processes that take about half of our energy are supported by the, the microcurrent. 
and therefore more energy is freed for re reproduction or for 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 mm. growth. Mm. And so he has demonstrated. Initially, he did this with corals, and then he did it with seagrass, Posidonia in Italy. That he can basically regrass, uh, regrow Posidonia me meadows at eight times the speed using this this technique. I thought everybody would just be fully up for being, but so many yeah. days here where you could just say let's take this 200 by 200 meter seafloor area put four boys down put a yeah. net around it say this is what we're doing here and just see what happens huh? ha, you wouldn't believe how much flack you get for that uh, but mm. uh, have you come across the, the so so much to, yeah so much to, um to discuss so yes i totally agree with the dogma the dogma of conservation. In fact, that's to me, it's, it really is a, it's almost an antiquity mindset of, of like, let's keep these antiques of ecosystems in a way that is completely not um, relevant to what, where we're heading. So much of the questions is really about, are we enabling evolution to occur? Are we actually creating the enabling conditions for further evolution to occur or are we holding it back you know at the end of the day that's that's it and it's um but then seagrass specifically it's an it's a fascinating topic because it does have that canary in the coal mine um uh indicator of health and so it actually serves as a bioregional signal mm -hmm. but nobody knows about it it's it and it also has of course the, the uh, energy and the power and the regenerative capacity like a rainforest and a coral reef, but nobody knows about it. So it's this hidden system that is that and in this particular um, bioregion, there has been so much uh, industrial activity. This was the military industrial complex for World War II, um, just because the, the whole battleship group it was closer to, to Europe, so they stationed here. So talk about UXO and all sorts of other um, elements from the day. Uh, so the seagrasses have actually contracted and expanded. It's, it's sort of the story of bioregional health that is completely we're blind to. So what we're trying to do is reimagine that story. And if we can use this idea of, of understanding the relationship of who we are as people as part of nature the food system this is we're becoming a, a foodie destination from around the world so turn this in and turn the opportunities for local food and the issue in the relationship to wastewater and wastewater treatment and biological nutrient reduction and all of those aspects in relation to the seagrass meadows. And while yes, there are opportunities to do some direct transplanting, really it's, it's, this, it's this almost act and love of seeing and being. And the, there will be both actual diving into the meadows and that feeling of of just soaring over the the and into the um these absolutely extraordinary habitats but also the digital twin the ability to let people do that same thing on their computer and wherever so that they're getting that sense of the love of place so we're we're beginning to work with this concept of a bioregional digital twin what does it mean to actually create a a biophysical system of which we're working on a, a gaming component that the in order to actually create the digital twin it takes a village and you need to get people to game into the connection of where these systems are from a bioregional standpoint. And so these are early, early days, but I'd love to keep you abreast of how we're developing I, this. I, I mean, that, that that opens up a whole nother, I mean, we, there's just so, so many avenues that I would actually really love to have a deeper conversation with you about because because I really appreciate your, your angle on these things. Like for, for me, if I'm honest, when I hear digital twin, on the one hand, I can see of course, the capacity that that would a engage a whole nother group of people that would otherwise be less engaged. Mm -hmm. um, I can see how 
a narrative of doing this kind of work that includes that is so much more easily fun funded than a narrative that excludes that. And it ra raises all sorts of alarm bells with me um, because, um, and, and I think that's exactly also the dance where, where maybe it'd be interesting yeah. to come back to your background with, with the sustainer metrics and, and like in many ways you have held for me the paradox of on the one hand saying mm -hmm. yes data is super important and we need to work with it well and we need to know our methods of how to work with data but i think you've always also pushed the understanding that that is also just a limited view of reality yes and that yes even if we have the yes. most powerful algorithms and the most powerful computer and the most ubiquitous sensoring on the planet we will only and and we have a digital twin of a bioregion or a digital twin of Earth, like some people are working on. Mm -hmm. It's a model, it's a map. Yeah. Don't mm -hmm. confuse the map with the territory. And my big question yep. is we have a resource problem. Are these people idiotic to spend that much time on trying to create a copy of what we actually need to love and take care of? Like, um, <clears throat> for me, I'm. I'm I fall on the Luddite side and I try to critique myself for it, but the logic in my limited perspective seems to be on the Luddite side. Like yeah, we're, we're mistaken by thinking that, that we can, well, what's the point? Like make people fall in love with the real bioregion rather than the digital twin. Well, it's a beautiful, and I love that. And let's keep bringing up the alarm bells because that's the only way we're going to learn and get better. But I'll tell you the reason why I came to this is because of governance. Mm -hmm. We are, we are, um, you know, we're, this, uh, the signals, you know, the great turning is all about ultimately bringing in new regenerative forms of good governance. And what does that mean? How does that ultimately lead to changing who and what we are as stewards and as participants and as enablers of evolutionary change? Currently, our governance structures are based upon meetings and the meetings and the, the decision-making and the decision-taking of these meetings is done in place-based areas that are, that are outside of any sort of bioregional thinking. Mm -hmm. The whole purpose of this, of creating a bioregional twin is for creating avenues for governance, for decision-making that you're actually on a map. Yeah, but-, but the, And you're, I, you're making think, decisions based upon the map itself. No, I, it. I, I completely hear you. And I'm just wondering whether, you know how things get co-opted, the whole thing about yes. horizon two one and horizon two, uh, like yep. horizon two plus and horizon two minus. Yep. Yeah, and and the the danger of ultimately because I like there's a pa paper that I would love you like the, have you heard of the work of Camila Moreno? She's she's a Brazilian researcher who currently works at the Humboldt University in Berlin, ah, and huh. she wrote a really fascinating piece. Like if you if you look for the PDF, carbon metrics, environmental abstraction and ecological epistemicide. Mm. PDF Heinrich Böll Foundation. Um, it's the beginning of a discourse that came that she started through the Heinrich Böll Foundation and some other researchers in response to the wonderful results of the, Paris, the celebrated Paris Agreement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To say yes and and what yeah. she was what she was flagging up was that by creating a twin narrative between digitalization and measuring everything and decarbonization, we were reducing our spectrum mm. for possibilities entirely to large multinational corporations and state actors offering solutions and mm. every other way of being, what we're actually working on, you and I, like place sourced regeneration, yeah. doesn't fit on that landscape because mm. ultimately what you're creating by focusing on this data-focused approach is something that can be co-opted by anybody who says, you know what, and I've heard this so many times in California uh, or from people from California, you know what, we're just too stupid as a species. We need a really good data set and we need good algorithms and we need the computers to tell us what to do. 
And of course, some yeah. demagogue oligarch will have the ultimate key to tell the computers what to tell us to yeah. do. Yeah. And we're just going to be bloody sheep. And yeah. we've built the, the encirclement the, 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 mm. of our own freedom. We've built ourselves by going that pathway. That's what I'm worried about. This yeah. is with all these wonderful people that are saying, I'm going to develop an app or a decentralized autonomous organization or a cryptocurrency and, and yeah, yeah, all yeah. based on the mobile phone that will somehow enable peasant farmers to earn twice, not just for the produce of what mm. they produce, but also for the regenerative impact they have on their land. Wonderful intention. Love these people. But what happens if that infrastructure transforms the epistemology of that farmer to the point that he cannot be himself without a mobile phone? Mm -hmm. Is that what we actually want to create? Can we wake up to how our Western highly educated technology will so solve the thing is running even through our offers in how to yeah. and I, I'm saying this because I, I know that you've been right in the middle of trying to dance with this dragon. Yeah. And it has been dancing with the dragon. Yeah. yeah, and it has been. And it has been. It's beautifully said. In fact, there's a great Wendell Berry um, interview on The New Yorker. If you've not seen it, I'll send it to you. Mm -hmm. But he yeah. speaks directly to this issue. He speaks to this. He doesn't even have a computer. I mean, he's, you know, the, the writer of such prolific language and talk about um, understanding place. And he's, he speaks exactly to this issue. But to me, it is a both and. It, it is it is not about ignoring it. It's about then if we then can use it, how and what does that mean? And, and one of the things that we're doing is we're creating, at least in this these early ideas, mm -hmm. data sovereignty at the bioregional scale. And this is largely informed by um, a lot of indigenous colleagues who absolutely refuse to share any. They, they're becoming amazingly good at GIS many of the indigenous colleagues we work with, but absolutely will not share it because rightfully so to map something is to then take. Mm -hmm. And so how do you then create a data sovereignty approach mm -hmm. that, that honors the wisdom of a place? And how do you root it in the place itself? It's, it's as it, it gets back to the ownership um, of land. How do we relocalize data Mm -hmm. so that the data itself is of the place. And that's and it's not this sort of cloud co-opted um, thing that's linked to corporate entities. Now, is, that's not easy. That's a navigation. Exactly, because you, you literally have to, I mean, this is where, where I feel like, again, I have to be transparent here. What I feel a little bit awkward about, and just recently bought out of an event because of that awkward sense of, I'm a, I have a lot of tendency, so I'm a bit overly critical of technology. Mm -hmm. and, and because of that, I am a little bit slower in, like if I'm overloaded and I have 50 things that I would like to tunnel in deeper, um, going into cryptocurrencies and um, <laughs> decentralized autonomous organizations is very high on my radar because it constantly pops up, but but it's not where I'm naturally drawn to. And therefore, yes. I feel Same like... Here. The, the the proviso is to say, look, this guy's talking out of his backside because he doesn't mm. actually know as much what he's talking about. But I do intuitively sense into these things and that might or might not be worth anything. And, and I feel like the holochain people are talking about a fundamental restructuring of the infrastructure in order to enable what you were just talking about, to actually create a new infrastructure where ownership is more personalized. But, but even there, it's the kind of, like as an analogy, the wonderful people who set up seeds, which also seems to be yeah. super sound intention, doing wonderful work, as far as I can tell. They they ran this beautiful course, um, Tools for the Regenerative Renaissance, that this, this amazing young woman, uh, Phoebe Tickell and, and her friend Chris, sorry, spicing on his name, organized. And the brilliant idea was that people applied to do the course. And as long as they went through a couple of hoops in order to ensure that they actually did it, they then didn't have to pay for the course, but got paid 350 seats mm. for having accomplished the course, which I thought was wonderful. And I, I was offered twice the opportunity to just have a, like offer some input with that group. And they were paying me 350 seats for that. 
but I'm too busy and I can't be bothered yes. to set up a, a, a digital wallet in order to cash in my 700 seeds. And I wouldn't know how to pay yeah. taxes for that anyway. And the, the finding out is probably not worth the hassle. And, and yeah, that's slow adopter attitude, but it, it exemplifies. Do I want farmers to have to deal with how to deal with a mobile phone and a computer in order to get to the proficiency of IT in order to use any of these applications that these people are developing, however well their intentions? Or do people not have a right, like this fun, wonderful word, ecological epistemicide? Can yeah. we know the yeah. world in different ways than through data, through direct yeah. knowing? Yeah. And the wonderful yeah. Gary Snyder quote, I'm going to find this and read it. Yeah. I mentioned it earlier because it's just so powerful. Hold on a sec. Um, uh, yeah, I might even have it. Um, here it is. Um, because it's just so exemplifying because the utmost, the, the people that so many of these techies get like excited, literally excited when, when they talk about these big millionaires like me, Bezos and, and um, Musk, but this whole obsession with technology or the, the, the whole singularity university craze of, of up, like downloading consciousness on a microchip and implanting it into a bionic uh, um, robot to live forever. I, I think Gary Snyder really hits it on the nail here when he says, mankind has a rendezvous in this, uh, with destiny in outer space. Some have predicted, well, we're already traveling through space. This is the galaxy right here. The wisdom and skill of those who studied the universe firsthand by direct knowledge and experience for millennia, both inside and outside of themselves, are what we might call the old ways. Those who envision a possible future planet on which we continue that study and where we live by the green and the sun have no choice but to bring whatever science, imagination, strength, political finesse they have to support to the support of the inhabitory people, mm -hmm. natives and peasants of the world. In making common cause with them, we become re-inhabitory and we begin to learn a little of the old ways which, were, which are outside of history and forever new. That is powerful. And it even flies Beautiful. from the place of something else you mentioned earlier, the, the great turning meme. I've used it a hundred times. I love the framing of midwifing the old, uh, midwifing the new system and hospicing the old system and, and, and Joanna Macy's from mm -hmm. the life, from, from the industrial growth society to life sustaining society. But I had a conversation with um, Chris Johnston, who worked very closely with Joanna. Yeah. And I was mm -hmm. really encouraged to keep thinking something that was bubbling up in me by hearing him say something related to that. He said, we're beginning to question the great turning. We're oh, interesting. To, we're beginning to question the transition. Meaning. Yeah. And this relates to more what we, we both have a common friend with, with Tony Hodgson, the, yes. the, 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 mm -hmm. the wise elder. Yeah? Yes. And Tony, Tony, Tony's work with, with this, like pushing the board really out there beyond millennia, uh, working on, on um, J.G. Bennett's work. Mm -hmm. um, this notion of the future potential of the present moment mm. is something that is becoming clearer and clearer of my mind as being part of the, the thing here. Yeah? And the notion of transition will trap you cognitively in describing a perfect future scenario. And people hear it when I talk about regenerative cultures. They think it's some sort of utopia mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. that we need to strive for. But that's mistaken. It's actually our species' birthright. And all we need to do yeah, is to yeah, come yeah. back to it. And, and this is indigenous wisdom. I mean, right there, you're just yeah. describing, you're just describing a, a worldview and way of seeing that is very old. But this yeah. future potential at the present moment, that's stunning. The, and that it, just is so real. Yeah, you can it has, really it has, like go on, go on to a mountain that you love and sit completely. with that for half a day and you will. Mm. You you will benefit. I mm. it's, it's like it's it's one of those phrases that is unfolding in me. In, yes, in the most beautiful ways. 
And, and because what it, to my mind, what it speaks to is what you were saying earlier as well and what all your intentions are behind. Ultimately, it is about making people fall in love with place again yeah. to the point that they get humble enough to recognize themselves and the best potential future of themselves as expressions of place, not owners of place. And again, I'm, I'm just repeating indigenous wisdom. I'm not saying anything new here. Uh, but, but, but this is where we took the wrong detour, or not even the wrong, that's misframing it again. Like we took a fascinating detour five, eight, 10,000 years ago in some parts of the world, mm -hmm. when the whole empire story and power over story, the enlightenment, mm -hmm. the separation from started. But, mm -hmm. but I love Owen Barfield's framing from original participation of indigenous wisdom through the enlightenment of the separation science and technology to final participation, mm -hmm. which can only happen if we become re-inhabitory again. And that means yes. we have to be humble about the value of science. And the, the, the other thing that I wanted to, to share with you is this yeah. Wendell Berry quote that I just sent, I can't find it right now. Let me just see if I can quickly find it. Um, I need to look for Rob because I just, Rob posted something, Rob Hopkins. Mm. I, I felt moved to answer with a little meme picture that I've I used to send around the place. Let me just um, let me see where it is. Here. Um, I so love this, by the way, Daniel. I just <laughs> so love this. This is just uh, it's just filling my heart with with soul and wind and and energy. Likewise, likewise, oh. and we should do more. But look at this. Yeah. Does, can you see it now? Yes, I sure can. I love this Wendell Berry quote. Mm. Applying knowledge, scientific or otherwise, is an art. An artist is somebody who knows what to put where and when to put it. And that holds for technology, too. That is beautiful. I could, I mean, it's amazing because... <laughs> My children, I have two boys, uh, 24 and 26, and they would both laugh because they know I'm a Luddite as as much as there is one. Yeah. And so but it's that it's that it's that paradoxical sense of what's the opportunity of these different aspects. So so much of my life has been in the place and not digitally informed. And so I'm now becoming digitally informed in order to weave back into the local, into the, the basically the, the reimagining and, and the re-engagement and relocalization of place. So I see it as a, for me, it's a bit of an awakening and a bit of an opportunity, but I love to hear your, the alarm bells that you're, you're identifying. But I do feel that, that there is this opportunity mm -hmm. But it ha how it's framed, and I think that Wendell Berry quote is beautiful. The other um, quote that I that I like, my colleague Stephen Olson um, says this: um, Science doesn't tell us. Science tells us what is, not what should be, mm -hmm. and that's where we need this whole different way of engaging of what should be. And this is that future potential, the present moment is well, yeah, what is, what, what's emerging. But that's the funny thing, because what should be can also take people into the future state visioning and backcasting. Yeah, right? yeah, totally. And, yep. and, and yep. so um, that's yep. why, why I, that I think that I'm more and more deepening into my... I, I need to, I'm slow with my learning from Carol Sanford's wisdom and from Regenesis wisdom because I somehow initially feel a bit like the language doesn't immediately mm -hmm. fit in. And so, so sometimes stuff sits with me for a long time and then I need to reword it in my own thinking. And then suddenly I kind of go, wait a minute, I learned that from them, but I, uh, but mm -hmm. it just finally sunk in. And, and it's this deeply going into the specificity. Goethe would have said into the phenomenon itself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Goethe would have said it, Jung would have said it. The yep. German tradition yep. was actually very onto something there. Yeah. It, it, like when, when Goethe said many, many, many moons ago, may goddess keep from single vision and Newton's sleep. Mm. He was speaking to what I would say was the pot like when when you were working with sustainable metrics and working on on statistics type stuff 
Yeah. As you, I'm just asking you, as you're now moving into this deeply land-based um, work, mm. what my proposition, having been indoctrinated by holistic science masters at Schumacher College and the wonderful work of, of, of Brian Goodwin and the science of quality, would be that what you were mainly looking at with the sustainer metrics data was quantifiable, analyzable data that was expressible in a p-value or some something like yeah, that. Yeah, actually or not. Free but yeah. choice profiling and, yeah. and, and th those kind of things. But, but my question is, is there something around qualitative, what Nora Bateson would call transcontextual warm data? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Direct knowing where you, where you can't put it in to data sets, nor into scientific standardized format, but you still know because you've been in that canoe for a whole day with the seagrass. Yeah, no, I, I'll tell you the origin story of sustainometrics because it's completely not that. Okay, That's cool. the irony. That's the irony. Yeah. It is completely not. It's 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 acknowledging that P exists and statistical rigor exists, but it's completely going in the in the other direction of really trying to understand um, realities. And it's and it's from a triple loop learning standpoint, it's moving to that second and third, and it's it's trying to understand sort of the art of the seeing. What is what is who's the seer and what's the seeing? Um, but so my early days was in restoration ecology. And this is where I spent a lot of time. I spent years um, with a, um, at the National Aquarium and was both profoundly um, astounded by the animal care and the sort of the use of animals as drivers of conservation ethic and the huge opportunity of what it means to inspire action. And so again, paradox, paradox, paradox um, mm -hmm. all throughout. But in leaving that, my commitment was to try to actually work in coastal systems to work and, and try to figure out ways so that the communities of these coastal systems can learn to see and love, well, the love is often already there, but how do they? How do, can we help them see and grow that stewardship ethos that is oftentimes deep within the ethos already? It's almost like reimagining and allowing them to reconnect with um, their roots. So, Sustainometrics was this almost like a joke of a name <laughs> that was that was used as almost like a Trojan horse to to. Um, to have a sort of legitimized name, but really the metrics it is all about me. learning. We projected a different story. Oh my gosh! It's yeah. and it's all about it's all about this adaptive learning. Yeah. It's all about learning, 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 and meaning not knowing. Mm -hmm. Meaning it's about questions. It's not about answers. I feel like I feel like to fill in a blank that we both know, but somebody else who might listen to this later, if we do put it online doesn't know is that we met at a rather nerdy uh, but wonderful and uh, interesting meeting that Citra financed on the importance of second order science on policy yes. making. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But that was Indeed. exactly I mean that's what we're talking about here. Like and, and that's that's what Goethe was talking about, single vision and not Newton sleep. If you do not pay attention to what many years later Maturana and Varela pointed yeah. out, like we bring forth a world because the, the way that we see the world actually influences what shows up. Heisenberg yeah. did it in physics a hundred years earlier. Yeah. We don't observe nature, we observe nature exposed to our method of questioning. It's, it's running as an alternative cultural discourse through Western science. Richard Tarnas has written about this very mm -hmm. beautifully yeah, in The Passion of the Western Mind, that this other way of embodied knowing, of understanding the cognitive dimension of knowing, and the narrative dimension of knowing of who are we, what is the world, how does yeah. it all fit together, that, that we are actually deeply influenced by our cosmology to the point that we then create literally a different reality space in which we move. And, and, and I think that this is also what, what the word re-inhabitation is inviting yeah. us back into. It's not just how do we get the right systems in place and do renewable energy and, and local food sovereignty and local water sovereignty, yep. water sovereignty and, and all of that. We need to have those conversations, but it will only work if we get out of the way and become 
landscape again. Like if, yeah. we, if we really kind of say, okay, if we like, it's two weird paradoxes that that we need to overcome. That it's how, that we we feel separate from the world, that, but we are actually the world. Yeah. Like to, to have the capacity to understand that it's a both and, and that the way that at the level that we are indigenous to life, we are immortal. And we're all brothers and sisters. More than that, yeah. we're expressions of the same Truly. tree. We're yes. not. We're not separate. And I think this notion indigenous to life, as you're working with indigenous people, is is really important because, and and every indigenous elder, is is going to agree we are indigenous to life. But any traumatized person who is jumping on an indigenous soapbox to build a platform based on those non-indigenous people. Mm. Uh, to be silenced for the next 500 years because we were silenced for 500 years mm-hmm. is actually not at the development level to really help us heal the trauma yeah. that clearly was caused. And so we, we need that higher ground of finding our common indigeneity to life. We, we won't solve the Ukrainian-Russian problem and, mm. and the power blocking between NATO, China, and, and India and wh- whoever else in this conversation if we don't find the higher ground that all indigenous nations share. Yeah, we're truly. expressions of the tree of life. Life is a planetary process. So I, what makes me think of is Nietzsche at this point and the beginning of Zarathustra, um, where he speaks of the stages and this developmental pathways um, of our consciousness. And we begin um, as, the, um, as a camel, and it's that that loadedness that we put on ourselves and the camel, the degree to which the camel is weighed with the heaviness of, of the, um, the asks of society and the, the nature, as he describes, of how far the camel goes into the, the desert carrying this load and the transformation into the lion. And it's only in that and how that transformation happens is entirely individual. But if it does, that that lion has one task, and that's to kill the dragon. And on every scale of the dragon are the rules of society from 2000 years ago to yesterday's newspaper. And it's the thou shouts, the what we must do. And if it was a well-loaded camel, if a transformation has occurred into the powerful lion, then there may be a chance for that lion to kill the dragon of society's control. And, and as he writes, and I'm gonna butcher the German, but he, he writes about the wheel coming out of the center of the lion. And it's this, it's this rebirth this reimagination, and I think what you're describing, this reinhabitation, is really this this what is it? Rod uh, Roland from uh, from uh, you know the uh, the center, mm-hmm. um, and that is just so. And and I I absolutely think um, Goethean reality and the inner dimensions, the the uh, folk building, um, mm-hmm. that was so critically important. So yes, yes, yes. Because, I mean, this is, you, you, when you when you take a look at um, John Ennis's website mm, with the design mm. journeys, and like we we just had this because Goethe and and of course the whole romantic influence, um, Humboldt, Schiller, Hegel, yeah. Fichte. Yeah. And produced a culture that was extremely educated down to everybody. Mm, yeah. um, and and, and um, Thomas Bjorkman writes about this in, in the Nordic secret with regard to the, the, um, yeah. the Nordic societies being also inspired by the German romanticism to create these forums of public discourse where even yeah. the the underprivileged had opportunities to engage with this kind of thinking and conversation. Yep. Uh, yep. And um, Geddes yeah. went to Germany to travel across Bavaria at one point and oh, his, interesting. Whole, his whole notion, I believe, his whole notion of synthetic education and transdisciplinary education, mm. bringing Humpty Dumpty back together again by yeah. not specializing. Uh, 
by taking biology as the, the way into talking about life and becoming a founding father of sociology and town planning by accident while he was mm-hmm. teaching biology at Dundee, um, is actually somewhat influenced by this experience of him get, getting off um, carriages. I, I can't remember where I read this, but it's in his, his memoirs or something. He, he d- describes how he got out of a carriage in somewhere in Southern Germany and talking to the young woman that served him in the local um, mm. locals, restaurant. Wow. Yeah? Yeah. And, and noticing that she had basic English, that she, um, that, that she knew a few data points of culture that he would have not expected um, mm. talking with her. And, and so, so anyway, this, this whole notion of like, Geddes was fully there. Like he, mm. he mm. understood, like influenced by his biological training and then reading Jan Christian Smuts book on holism, it somehow clicked and all the, the like every time I'm kind of moving into a next phase of how do we activate this? I come up with something and then I kind of go, oh yeah, get us to that too. <laughs> and like in conversation with John Ennis, we, we remembered like Jen, John's new project for this year is to create a modern day version of the Evergreen, which mm. was a four part magazine that edit, get his co-edited with artists in Scotland in order to use art as a means to fall in love with nature again. Mm, and and one, beautiful. Could, one, one could push it both out as far as that it influenced the Scottish Art Deco Jugendstil movement and ultimately mm. influenced Jugendstil across Europe. That mm. back, coming back to floral motifs and, 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 and nature motifs from, from a more abstract kind of Rococo and whatever that came before, um, the the very engagement of artists is what something that I've, I've realized is so central in this. If we want to create re-inhabitory place-based cultures that fall in love with their place, we're not only going to do it through science. We need yeah, completely. to sing, to dance, to poem it, to, to find different ways of, of languaging it, because that will get people in their bodies, not just mm. in their minds. Couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. And it's everything from dance to poetry to music. There was um, the Museum of Modern Art in um, in in um, New York, in Manhattan. Oh, boy, it had to have been 10, 15 years ago, had an entire exhibit that was dedicated to the rising seas. And so they looked at the greater Manhattan area and they imagined Okay, mm-hmm. what's it going to look like? And so they brought the artists together. Mm-hmm. And there was this one, um, and it wasn't just art interpretation. It was, it had engineering and had some other things involved. Um, but it was, it was this true um, pluralism of thinking around a central response challenge. And one of the, um, one of the uh, participants in this was, had, some work with some engineers and they wanted to create a a structure that wasn't in the building but it was out and it was in beautifully um, designed segmented breakwater to uh, that had all sorts of kelps and um, and um, bivalves and other things that was woven in with the rocks so it had the structural bit but had the living bit as well and it was more done as as a sort of an artistic engineering treatment for the um for the exhibit Mm -hmm. people could visit it well just after the exhibit closed hurricane sandy hit and there was this massive destruction in this particular area where this segmented breakwater was placed and behind it behind the segmented breakwater there was natural overwash and and it was and and a lot of the the bivalves and the kelp had detached um but the the living matter was there and um, and so it's just a, just another great example of art informing and guiding the way forward. It's you know we need the poets, we need the artists, we need, need these are the seers, and so how do we create this seeing? Well, um, they they are the people who in a culture that got increasingly influenced by scientism rather than science. Yeah, um, they were 
given the permission to say, well, we're not we're not scientists, we're artists. We do yeah. we do things differently. So 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 they and they were encouraged to encounter the phenomenon rather yeah. than to abstract things. Like Beautiful. I mean, of course, there's abstract art, but you, you still try to encounter the object that you'd somehow create an artistic expression of. Um, and but it's a more participatory encounter, particularly yeah. the way that, and so so it's it's just it, it's a representative of a yeah. different way of seeing that is probably closer to indigenous understanding yeah. than, than than is modern science. And and I'm I'm working on a little series with Hawkwood College um, Center for Future Studies to to have these conversations with artists because I I really would like mm. to to kind of catalyze that to just run its own course, um, both in terms of the, the visual art, but also in terms of um, like, this is something that I've been trying to see for a long time, the, the, like musicians picking up these yeah. and, and, and re-enchanting the world. But I, I just wanted to share something else with you because you mentioned poems and I actually shared it with, with Bill and um, Anna yesterday in a conversation, but it's, it, it's a poem that John Ennis, that I, who I mentioned earlier, um, mm. shared with me last Friday. And for me, it really speaks to working from essence in a way that I never really mm. understood until I re mm. read that poem. Mm. Um, and it's, it's called The Clearing by Martha Postlewaite. Mm. So I'll try to read it. Um, yes. do, not, do not try to save the whole world or do anything grandiose. Instead, create a clearing in the dense forest of your life and wait there patiently until the song that is your life falls into your own cupped hands and you recognize it and greet it. Only then will you know how to give yourself to this world so worth of rescue. Uh, <laughs> isn't that it gives me the chills every time i read it i've read it about uh, right there 20 times oh since my god it's, it's just amazing uh -huh. oh what a gift mm -hmm. oh that's it mm -hmm. and if we all do that then then we are aligned with life's regenerative impulse then life mm -hmm regenerates through us and and I, I think that's what carol is talking about when she speaks about essence to essence conversations and all yeah. the, the, the somewhat cryptical language but but it's actually really to the point yeah. well one of the things that that um i'm really interested in is on the art dimension is to create a that is both free form and emergent, but has a bit of structure to it, but engages around the Gulf of Maine, that it has a, a wider bioregion to it. This is one of the most rapidly warming uh, water bodies on Earth, um, second only to the Arctic. And it's largely because... I thought the Mediterranean is also... The yeah. Med is, is, is just below, mm -hmm. as I understand it, just below the Gulf of Maine. But here, there's its re regime shift. Basically, the um, what was once dominant Labrador current coming from the north and bringing cold water into a very narrow fire hose of a of a basically a cut. This was um, back when the ocean floor, the um, all the waters were in glaciated um, ice, and um, there was a big wide coastal plain, and there was a basically a cut through. Well, that cut right now is the dominant um, entrance for the ocean gyres that are coming in the ocean currents. And what was once the dominant current from the Labrador current from the north is actually shifting to the Gulf Stream. So you're getting a completely different sourcing. So it's not an incrementalism. It's a, it's a complete regime shift. And it's so transforming everything. It's pulling warm water up. Yeah, yeah, warm pushing. water. The Gulf Stream's coming uh, closer to land. Um, it's moving to the west, so moving to the land, and it's actually coming in and taking over where the other Labrador current, and that's actually slowing down because of the um, that current itself is actually the slowing. The pump is slowing down. Exactly, yeah. and and this has a huge amount of issues of the um, freshwater 
melt water coming off of the I mean, that's, glaciers. That's, that's the that's the future scientific scenario that they play through in the day after tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in this, but in this particular case, it is a phenomenon of um, just a local transformation um, that is regime shift, and so we know so much about. Um, sort of the biophysical aspect. It's one of the most studied systems like the med, but we know almost nothing about the response to change um, in terms of what the collective and specific places are actually doing in response. And therefore what I'm and a few others are thinking about is art. Let's, let's ask this question and let's convene this this opportunity for art that is held and housed in certain um, art type settings, but that brings it further forward that asks these questions about what is our, how do we better see our response to change? Um, and what does that mean? You, you now triggered me three times to, to mention him and now I remember. Um, do you know the work of Newton Harrison? No, I don't. That's new. Oh, this is a this is a home run. Um, <laughs> check, check check out check out the Center for the False Mayor, mm. based in California. This is Newton Harrison and his wife started to the movement of environmental art in the 1960s and were very ah. successful with it and created this foundation in. I wanted to mention him earlier when you were talking about Tayside because Newton yeah. recently, two years ago, did something. It was a traveling exhibition that went across Scotland. Mm. It was beautifully called The True Wealth of This Nation. Mm. And it was a play on Adam Smith, but it was talking about the reforestation of Scotland and the Caledonian Forest. And then it used mm. scientific data and a little animation to pre, like, sage the sea level rise and the turning of scotland into a set of archipelagos as mm. as the mainland gets cut, cut off as the caledonian channel floods and all, all those kind of things um but it's it's a level of scientific realism and restoring mm. that brings in the power of reforestation and a, and a utopian future within a dystopian climate change context, so to speak. Yeah. Um, it's gorgeous. And, and, and his art is, is, ne is never like strong on the sort of aesthetic component of conventional art. It's always more provocative, but it's, it's using exactly what you were talking about. It's taking scientific data points into yeah. an art conversation space to create cultural conversations that with people that wouldn't go to a professor having a giving a talk on this because it would just be too boring and yeah they wouldn't yeah. Be included there's things like um there's this brilliant piece I'm, I'm sure i could find it of a cellist and what they were playing the music they were playing is the amount of carbon in mauna loa and they would just be playing um this incredible piece but the music they were scoring from is is sort of the carbon increase atmospherically um sensed by a certain place so it, it's we need to do these things you know the person who's done this for many many years and is now kind of yeah i mean there's comes a point where everybody is ready to retire and, and just focus on their family easier because he's getting older um is um and i'm spacing on the name he's um just been in touch with him um the guy who built the contraction and conversion framework and tried to get that into the climate change discourse. He's, mm. he's a South African, um, Aubrey Mayer, now I have the name. Oh, yeah. he's, a, he's, a, he's a South African high level violinist. I think he was prima vi a violin of the Durban Symphony Orchestra or something like that. Mm. And when he clicked onto climate change in the mid nineties, like a mm. long time ago, he, he, said like this is only going to work if like contraction and convergence is in a nutshell mm. recognizing that the global north had a unfair advantage and couldn't just go to the global south we don't want you to develop because mm. it emits too much carbon and and so it needed to contract and let them converge and mm. did, but but his entire way of thinking about why this was work was built on 
musical theory and the octave. And ah, so when he gave beautiful. talks, he would just pull out his his, his, his violin and mm. demonstrate eh, mm. what 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 is a syntony and what is a dissonance eh, mm. as future pathways. Mm. Ch check out a couple of online talks by Aubrey Mayer. He's 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 a gem, um, a real elder. Uh, mm, incredible. And you had um, and wasn't Robert Fripp involved in um? Yes, yes, he was in in with H three Uni. Yeah. yeah, is he still is sort of in the wind? And is would he similarly speak of this language of, of I, music? I'm not, is... the, I'm, I'm not directly in touch with him. The, the the person that has a close link with him is Tony Hodgson, yeah. who through the background with JG Bennett, because Fred yeah. also got touched by Cone Springs somehow, and and so they they share a. a common kind of lineage which which interestingly enough there is a lineage like charlie crone who Kara sanford worked with a lot also um took over some concepts from from um bennett so so mm. there be a link of that thinking that 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 matches with the sort of american regenerative mm. incredible well, my brother, um, let me ask yeah. you a very basic question. How is there anything that I could do in service to you? Is, is there anything I'd love to gift something or or an an energy of of gratitude um, for just the relationship, the conversation, hopefully the birth of many more conversations. Um, but is there anything I could do for you? <laughs> Lovely question, but I, I mean, the, the one thing that I thought as I heard you mention and learned more about your background, the whole coastal yeah. conservation, preservation, management, like actually your background might be really useful as a scientist as well. And as in what you've what you've done to help this conversation that my friend Brad Robertson is trying to nurture here around the island with Save mm. the Med. Um, I won't go into it in detail, but, but, but there's this whole concept developing that, that Brad and I have been in, been in conversation around um, of creating a new area denomination mm. called Area Under Regeneration. Mm, that, beautiful. That is soft enough so it can be an inclusive map of all sites of special scientific interests, all reserves, all marine protected areas, all mm -hmm. custodian ship sites or whatever. And, but also map using the common land three uh, landscapes, mm -hmm. basic mapping, the underlying, like this, these are core reserves, these are mixed areas, these are in the, like, like habitation areas. And, and begin to use that language of the four returns then of, of like mm -hmm. the return of inspiration, the social ecological return that ultimately vitalizes regional eco yeah. economics and then leads to an economic return of the right kind of mm -hmm. local econo e economics and vitality being regenerated. And, and I just have a sense that at some point I would love to call on you to have a chat with Brad and maybe let him present what they're up to and, and just give him some of your wisdom. So mm. it would be directly to me, but it would be, and it might be the beginning of weaving a stitch that leads us towards you coming to go cycling on Mallorca with, with us. In, yeah. Um, um, I love it. December. Consider it done. I, I would love that. And, and this idea of being part of the systemic cycling is really wonderful. Um, and that actually, there is a window of my calendar, not that I want to travel more, but that would be, that would be meaningful, mm -hmm. deeply meaningful. So if there is oh, the possibility. The, the concept is the following that, that, and, and I'll share as soon as the things are shareable, I, I have now have you in mind to share all this with you. And, and if you want, I'll, I'll put you in touch with Tobias Luther immediately because you should. That'd be great. Here. That'd be great. And I'd love to, uh, yeah. as an honor to you also, I'd be willing to, um, and I probably, hand this off to one of our, our team. In fact, it might be Sigrid, um, but to to um, put a transcript together on this conversation, mm. if you'd like. Sure. So to actually yeah. write yeah. it up. Um, yeah. And because with that comes all sorts of fertile ideas to think back of all the different mm. references, good links. Well, um, it's much easier to, to 
make use of all because we opened yes. up so many oh boxes. Oh my gosh, because this is a this has uh, been a meal. This has been a ten course meal. Shall we share this meal through Voices of the Regeneration? Shall I put it in the series? I don't think we've said anything we wouldn't say in public. Sure, why not? Yeah. Why not? And, and where, where do people find out more about, I mean, Sustainable Metrics website, but, but, but the, the bi-regional work you're doing, does it have a special site? <laughs> See, I'm a Luddite, I tell you. Yeah, it's, you all, it's all smoke and mirrors. Yeah. Um, we're working on a website right now that will be up soon that will have the bi-regioning work. Um, don't, don't feel bad. My website's been, <laughs> like for the last three years, while I'm having the most successful time in, in, in my working life, my website just gives you a don't go there it's dangerous uh, no, like, it's, it's been down for so long i, I don't care the, the people who need to find me find me uh, oh my gosh no it's so important and you are very good at um social media and i've i've long since um eschewed that but you've you've always impressed me as someone who's able to keep the regenerative dialogue going in social media so i I, I feel very much um, living through you and your ability to do that because I probably won't ever do that. Yeah, no, so I, I just I just have to honor you and um, and know that I live vicariously. No, I, I should stop that. You. I should stop that at some point. I mean, it's well, it's, it's, it's probably it's good though. Role, but it's just not necessarily my role forever. Like you, one has to know when. Like there's a, there's a sort of deeper learning apprenticeship phase now coming up that that uh, where it's better to quiet and, and like I'm a, it's it's good to be an advocate but you need to watch out for the moment when you hear yourself repeating things and falling into a groove and and all of that and and so I yeah. I, I feel like I, I it, it's been and that's why I really love these conversations like we just had and and that's one thing continuing to do social media work through sharing this kind of format yeah. Um, it just does what permaculture suggests. It stacks functions. Like yeah. it, this has been such a lovely, nourishing conversation for the two of us. Very few people are going to do a 90 minute session to listen to all of it. But those who do somehow actually probably also got something nourishing out of it. Otherwise, they would have clicked away a long time ago. Uh, and, <laughs> yes. and, 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 and I, I, more and more, and that's where I align also with Regenesis. It's, it's like building the field is about getting to enough people deeply, not about sound biting to the masses. Um, yes, yes, true that. And that, I think, is this power of, um, of having these, these events. And it's almost like performance art, these learning journeys, these systemic cyclings. This is performance art we've got to get good at. And it, and it is art and it is performance and it is participatory. Uh, and it's something that um, the, the, the San people of Southern Africa, um, they speak about big hunger and small hunger. And the small hunger is the things we need to keep us going. And of course, as we extract that to, um, to the stuff that we have, the cars that we drive, the houses, et cetera, the big hunger, that's the transformative experiences, those few things as we're nearing the end of our days that we think of and think, yes, that was a life well lived. We're absolutely starving mm. for that. So we're obese mm. from the small hunger and we're completely emaciated mm. and need that big hunger. So, so much of this work is, I believe it's about feeding that big hunger. Mm. And as you said so beautifully that, that the future potential in the present moment, that's how do we see that that feeds the big hunger? Mm. Yeah, it's, I think if you generate moments where people are struck by awe and fall in love mm. with, their deep relationship to all that is for that moment. That is the future potential of the present moment that yeah. does change the future. Like we, we, we think that we need to create a plan and key performance indicator and implement it and create the <laughs> blueprint and all of that. And, and <laughs> no. yes, we, 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 we might have to do that too, but we need to make that clearance in the forest of our lives to let the song that is our life fall into the cup hands, as that poem says. Uh -huh. From that place, we can then do all the planning and blah, blah, blah in a very, very different way. Uh, yeah. 
Lovely, such a such a gift to to spend time with you and beautiful. And I, I, I'll put you in touch with with Tobias because the the notion of this event in Mallorca is like this this systemic cycles is to actually train up other people to become like to take the concept Good. not in a, in a franchise you have to pay but more in a yeah, yeah. franchise please let's nurture this in a kind of keep keep the 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 essence the right? flame yeah? the um, flame yeah and, the and essence i wouldn't be surprised because he mentioned that somebody in america is also keen on doing it in their regions and i have a either false or true deja vu that he said portland um, huh. so, so, so there might be somebody in, in your region already wanting to come in order to do systemic cycles, but I need to check that with Tobias, but I'll, I'll put you in touch. and then. We'll, oh my uh, gosh, it yeah. would be an absolute honor. Great. Daniel, incredible. You've just, you've, you've fed me, you've, you've fed the big hunger. Um, <laughs> so let's keep, let's Likewise. keep feeding each other and let's keep um, doing everything we can. But boy, it is just so nice to know that, that your heart beats and we're occasionally able to share comments and, and ideas and thoughts. Please, let's, let's do it more often and also know that that in your weavings, like as you mentioned at some point, like if, if there is a group that you work with and you want to have a conversation, I'm, I'd, I'd love to meet that group at some point. Fantastic. We'll, we'll uh -huh. Fantastic. Okay. Well, Lots with that. Love. Have a wonderful day. Thank Bye. you. You too, my brother.